Hey everyone, it's Sarah Threadster, Nurse RN.com, and in this video, I'm going to be going over part two of COPD, where I'm going to be covering the nursing interventions and the medications. Be sure to check out part one because that video lays the foundation for this video because I discuss the pathophysiology, the types, the signs and symptoms, the complications, and how it is diagnosed. And as always, over here on the side or in the description below, you can access the quiz and the notes that go along with this video. So let's get started. First, let's start out talking about the nursing interventions. What are you going to do for this patient as the nurse? Okay, number one, the most obvious is that you are going to monitor their respiratory system, which will include listening to those lung sounds, what's going on in there. And if they need suction, they may need nasotracheal suction. You'll assess their need for that based on their effort of breathing and um, their oxygen saturation. Also, you're going to be monitoring that sputum production. Your patients with chronic bronchitis, as we learned in part one, tend to have really um, productive coughs. So um, if ordered, you may need to collect a sputum culture because these patients are, are at risk for developing pneumonia. Another thing is that you want to monitor that oxygen saturation and keep it between 88 to 93%. Why this number? Because a lot of people are like, 95 to 100 is where we want to keep it. Well, the reason is, is because how COPD patients are stimulated to breathe. They are stimulated to breathe due to low oxygen levels. And as we learned in the previous video, this is what these patients have because of the obstructive airflow. So they're stimulated to breathe by low oxygen levels rather than high carbon dioxide levels which is how a person with healthy lungs is stimulated to breathe. Whenever their carbon dioxide levels are high, it stimulates them to breathe to blow that off, but not in this case. So we don't want to give them too much oxygen through a nasal cannula because this will not give their body an incentive to breathe. So they could stop breathing, causing them to hypoventilate, which in turn is going to increase that carbon dioxide even more and become toxic. Okay, so another thing is that we want to administer oxygen as prescribed by the physician, usually one to two liters. You don't want to usually go any higher than that. Monitor their effort of breathing because these patients are at risk with any activity depending on the severity of their COPD for um, episodes of shortness of breath. So you want to teach them about purse lip breathing and di diaphragmatic breathing and what are these? I would know these for tests, how to do it, how to teach a patient about them. Okay, let's talk about purse lip breathing first. And this is a great um, thing to use whenever your patient is having those dyspic episodes. It usually works even better than putting the oxygen on them because what it does is it increases the oxygen level. It encourages them to breathe out longer. So remember, um, the issue with this, these patients are retaining a lot of air volume due to um, what's been going on with their alveolar sacs and the bronchioles. So what they will do is they will breathe in and then blow out through pursed lips like they're trying to blow out a birthday candle. So it'll be something like this. And this encourages them to breathe out longer, to force that air out, help slow down that breathing and increase that oxygen level. Now let's talk about diaphragmatic breathing. This breathing uses the abdominal muscles rather than those accessory muscles for breathing. Because um, what has happened is these lungs have become hyperinflated. It's pushed the diaphragm down rather than having it dome shaped. And your diaphragm plays a huge role in your ability to breathe effortlessly. So what happens um, whenever you breathe, the diaphragm will help when it contract when it relaxes back up to force that air out. So you're getting all that volume out. But here it's flat and it's not doing their job. So your body starts using those accessory muscles to help get that air out of the lungs. 
So um, what, will, what will happen whenever you teach them this is that it will help strengthen that diaphragm. It will slow down the breathing rate and make it easier and decrease the energy used to breathe because using those accessory muscles to breathe burns a lot of calories. And that's why your patients, especially ones who have emphysema, will have weight loss and um, you need to encourage them to eat a lot of frequent small meals. So how you do that, you um, have the patient lay down, you can put a pillow underneath their knees and they will put one hand over their chest and one hand on their abdomen. And what they will do is that with their abdominal muscles, they will inhale in, move those muscles, not moving the chest muscles, but the abdominal muscles to force that air in. Then they will purse lip breathe out using the abdominal muscles instead of those accessory muscles. And that helps strengthen the diaphragm and discourage the use of those accessory muscles. Another thing is that you'll be administering breathing treatments. As the nurse, a lot of times in hospitals, respiratory therapy will participate in this as well. They give a lot of uh, nebulizer treatments, especially those short acting um, medic bronchodilators like albuterol, atrovent, things like that. But as a nurse, you will be giving scheduled or as needed inhaler. So your role, which we're gonna go over later in the lecture, is to know those category of drugs like long acting versus short acting. If they're having an acute episode, shortness of breath, you wanna give a short acting bronchodilator and you need to know what it is because it acts fast and those corticosteroid inhalers and things like that. Now let's talk about the education pieces that you wanna to provide to your patient who is struggling with COPD. Okay, the first thing is about nutrition needs, especially your patients who have the form called emphysema, which is your pink puffers, because they hyperventilate, they breathe rapidly, they use those accessory muscles as a, as a compensation mechanism to keep that oxygen where it needs to be. So they use a lot of energy doing this. So they need to be educated to eat high calorie and protein meals, and they need to be small but frequent because they don't want to eat three large meals a day. Why? The anatomy of how your body's set up, you have your stomach somewhere in this region. They already have hyperinflated lungs and abnormal flattened diaphragm. So if they go in, eat a lot of food, that stomach's gonna push up on those lungs, up on that diaphragm, and it's gonna cause them difficulty breathing. So it's best for them to eat small but frequent meals that are high and rich in protein. Also, they wanna stay hydrated drinking about two to three liters per day unless it's not contraindicated, like the patients with renal failure or heart failure who are on fluid restrictions. And the reason they want to stay hydrated is to keep those mucus secretions thin. They don't want them to be thick because it's gonna block the airway and cause a lot more problems. They want to avoid sick people and irritants out in the weather. So they need to watch forecasting, see if it's going to be a high alert day for air pollution. They need to avoid those days because this can trigger COPD exacerbation. And um, a lot of patients who have severe COPD, if they go outside whenever it's really, really hot or humid, it smothers them because of the humidity and extreme cold temperatures affect them as well. So let them know about that. Um, if your patient smokes, educate them on the importance of stop smoking because this can help improve the function of the lungs and to avoid people who smoke. That secondhand smoke is just as bad than smoking themselves. Also, have their vaccinations up to date uh, because if they get influenza or anything like that, that's gonna attack the lungs. This can cause COPD exacerbation and it's really hard for these patients to recover from this. And um, so they'll need to get the flu shot annually and the pneumonia vaccine every five years because they are at risk for developing um, certain forms of pneumonia and this shot can help prevent that or mild the symptoms. Okay, so let's look at the medication regimen for patients with COPD. As the nurse, what you need to be familiar with are those, group, those drug categories that's gonna be given in COPD, the major side effects that you need to watch out for that may be thrown on NCLEX and patient education pieces for the most important drugs. So to help you remember the typical drugs given in COPD, remember this mnemonic. 
chronic pulmonary medications save lungs. Here we have lung issues. These medications, along with lifestyle changes, um, help the patient have a better quality of life with their breathing. So first, the C, corticosteroids. What do corticosteroids do? They decrease inflammation and mucus production in the airways because, especially with chronic bronchitis, those bronchioles are inflamed. They're producing lots of mucus. Corticosteroids are gonna help decrease that. Um, help that immune system slow down its attacking. These are given, you can give them orally, IV, inhaled. Many times um, the inhaled ones will be given with a bronchodilator. Um, sometimes there's combination drugs. Some drugs you want to be familiar with is prednisone, solumedrol, Palmacor or Simbacor. Simbacor is a combination one. It is a steroid and it's a long acting bronchodilator. So side effects of corticosteroids, we covered this a lot in the endocrine series. So if you really want to dive into this, um, you can check out the endocrine series. I have a card should be popping up so you can access that. But side effects is easy bruising of the patient. A lot of times you'll see them they'll have bruises on their arms, on their legs. Their skin will even be really fragile and tear easily. So be easy with that. Um, they're at risk for hyperglycemia. I have seen this, this happens, especially your diabetic patients, you'll, or even if they're not diabetic, it can increase their sugars really, really high. So you wanna monitor their sugars. They're at risk for infection because corticosteroids suppresses the immune system. So they need to watch out for that and avoid those sick people. And um, if they use these over time, they're at risk for osteoporosis. Okay, piece that you really need to take away with bronchodilators and COPD, I mean corticosteroids and COPD, is um, if a patient is prescribed an inhaler that's a bronchodilator and an inhaler that's a corticosteroid, how, which one are you gonna use first? It's very important. First, they want to use the bronchodilator inhaler because what this does is they take it and it opens up those airways, it dilates those airways. Then five minutes later, they're gonna use their corticosteroid inhaler. Because those airways are nice and opened up and that corticosteroid can get in those airways that would have normally been closed off because they didn't use a bronchodilator and it can do its job. So remember that. Another thing you want to remember, after a patient uses their corticosteroid inhaler, they need to rinse their mouth. Another drug used, the P for phosphodiesterase force inhibitors, one is called refumilast, and this is used for people with chronic bronchitis, and it helps decrease COPD exacerbation. Now, it's not a bronchodilator. Okay, what you wanna remember about this drug are the side effects of it. Um, you want to assess your patient's mental status whenever they're on this because it can increase um, the thoughts of suicide ideation. So how I remember this, because there's a lot of drugs you have to memorize in nursing school, I look at the name and the last part of Refumilast is last. And last, it could be their last day. So you want to assess them for thoughts of suicide and report that to the doctor because this is not a good thing. And also they can have weight loss with this. So monitor their weight and teach the patient, you know, if you start having these thoughts, please report them and monitor your weight. Okay, next, methylxanthines. A drug in this category is known as theophylline. This is many times given orally and it's a type of bronchodilator. So it works by relaxing the smooth muscle, opening up those airways. And it is used for long term for patients who have severe COPD. Now, remember this about theophylline. It has a narrow therapeutic range. A lot of times test questions like to throw out patients on theophylline, you have a dose scheduled to give, here's your lab work on theophylline. It has an air therapeutic range and you want it between 10 to 20 micrograms per milliliter. So anything above that's bad and anything less than that, they're not receiving enough medication. Now, theophylline can increase digoxin toxicity. So if they're on digoxin, you want to make sure that their digoxin levels be monitored and it can decrease the effects of lithium and dilantin. Okay, next S for short acting bronchodilators. 
These relax the smooth muscle of the bronchial tubes and they're short acting so they're great in emergency situations where you're having some severe shortness of breath going on. Those airways are constricting up. It's going to go in there and open those up so the patient can breathe and when they need quick relief. So as the nurse know which ones are short and which ones are long. Some typical short ones, you have beta-2 agonists, albuterol, that's what that is, and anticholinergic, such as atrovan. Next, the last one, L for long-acting bronchodilators. These work the same as short, but the effects of the medication last longer. So the patient's gonna use them over a period of time. They'll probably be scheduled maybe once or twice a day. And um, just be familiar with which ones are long. You have beta-2 agonists like Salmetrol, and then you have anticholinergic like Spireva. Spireva, that's a real popular one. And what you wanna remember with this is, of course, you use the bronchodilators before you use, if they're on corticosteroids that are inhaled. So you would use this first, open up the airways, then use your inhaler of the corticosteroids. And some side effects, the beta-2 agonists, they can cause increased heart rate and urinary reti retention, and the anticholinergics can cause dry mouth and blurred vision. So be on the lookout for that and educate your patient about that. So that is about the nursing interventions and the medications used in COPD. Don't forget to watch part one and take the NCLEX review quiz that goes over these lectures. And if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and thank you so much for watching and please consider subscribing to this YouTube channel.